Um, I'm Kay Doe, and I want to welcome you on behalf of me and Lucia and uh, APS um, to everyone who's here to honor and to remember and to learn more about, in some cases, Janet Taylor Spence. To Lucia Albino Gilbert and me, uh, Janet was both a friend and a mentor, and we are delighted to be here to celebrate her life and her contributions with you. Janet made substantial contributions to our science throughout her professional career. We highlight two major areas of research in this symposium, one anxiety and the second gender. Janet also did valuable and abundant editorial work, helping to develop and polish and publish the work of others. And in the process, she was recognized by the National Academy of Sciences. APS was only one of the organizations to which Janet contributed during her academic career. But I believe it is the one that, in the end, was the most important to her. And so it is fitting that we are honoring her at this convention. In the next hour and 15 minutes, we want to give you a sense of the many ways in which the life of Janet Taylor Spence made a difference in the life of our field. C.N. Balak and Alice Egley will speak about the scientific work that has followed from Janet's contributions. Don Foss will talk about the professional range that Janet covered. And you will also see a little bit of Janet herself in a series of short film clips from an interview that I did with her a few years ago and that you can see in its entirety. Uh, actually, it was shown at the, at, here at the convention yesterday, I know. And you can also see it anytime by, uh, in the privacy of your own home by logging on to the APS website. And the next thing then that I'd like to do is start this off with Janet. Someplace in high school, I decided I wanted to be a psychologist. Now the embarrassing part is that I can't tell you what I knew about psychology. I knew absolutely nothing. I don't know where I heard about it, but that's what I decided I wanted to be. So off I went to Oberlin, I was going to be a psychologist. But it didn't turn out to be what I thought it was at all. It was a very, very tough course that, that we went through and had very little to, to do with, quote, people. Uh, the low spot was a, a point when I had to read in a course on comparative psychology a study on the classical conditioning of goldfish tails. That really tore it. I walked out of that class and said, I can't stand this. I'm going to change my major to political science. Well, I'd taken a lot of political science courses, and actually, I ended up with a double major. I was very cautious, and I wasn't willing to quite give up. But my senior year, I took a course in history of psychology. It was mandatory in those days. Uh, from a retired professor. This was wartime, so they brought back a lot of retired people to, uh, to teach these courses. Well, this was a marvelous course, and for the first time, I began to understand what psychology was all about, even the classical conditioning of goldfish to, to. Spence's early work on anxiety and performance will be a starting point for our first presenter, Cian Baylock, Professor of Psychology and Vice Provost for Academic Initiatives at the University of Chicago. Before I introduce Professor Baylock, we're going to see another brief film clip of Janet discussing her early work on anxiety. That I started out with investigating a theory about uh, manifest anxiety and how it affected uh, various kinds of task performances. But um, when I moved to the VA hospital, I didn't have a subject pool. There was no way I could continue that research. But I discovered that there was a very lively theory going on in schizophrenia about their sensitivity to what might be called rewards and uh, punishments in the old Thorndikean uh, sense of, the, of those terms. So I was in a very good position to start investigating the implications of that hypothesis. Here I had access to a large pool of schizophrenic patients. I had access as a comparison group to a large number of hospitalized uh, veterans who were there for medical reasons. So I was really able to get 
some fairly large stu scale studies going uh, on those particular hypotheses and actually um, have some articles in print. Continuing our discussion of anxiety, research is topics at the intersection of cognitive science and education. She studies the psychological and neural processes that influence performance from test taking to public speaking to athletics. And she employs a wide range of methods in her work, such as physiological measures of stress and neuroimaging techniques. A 2011 recipient of the Spence Award for Transformative Early Career Contributions, Baylock is a prolific and highly regarded scholar. She has authored more than 100 publications in addition to well-received books. These include Choke, What Are the Secrets of the Brain Revealed About Getting It Right When You Have To, uh, and a second book published in 2015, how the body knows its mind. Professor Baylock will discuss her current research on academic anxiety, math achievement, and the influence of parents and teachers. The title of her talk is From J.T. Spence's Manifest Anxiety Scale, 1953, to the present day, exploring math anxiety and its relation to math achievement. So, Professor Baylock. Well, thank you very much. Um, I've actually virtually met Janet Spence many times throughout my career. The first was when I was still in college. I was a cognitive science major at UC San Diego and trying to figure out what I was going to do after college. Um, my parents, my grandparents, I come from a family of lawyers, and so I decided I would go to law school. My mom knew if she told me not to go to law school, I most certainly would. So she spent the summer taking me out to lunch with every unhappy lawyer I knew, she knew. And by the end, I decided maybe not law school. Another thing she did was drag me over to Tolman Hall at Berkeley to look at some of the psychology journals that were there and just to get an idea of this field that I had been interested in um, and, and touched on from time to time. And I read an article by Janet Spence, in fact, one of her articles on manifest anxiety. And I thought, wow, people actually can study how we think and how it relates to performance, that's interesting. And this was in my early days at UC San Diego and I actually went back to college and did a paper on lacrosse and performance under stress, which I played there. And I thought, this is really interesting. I didn't realize someone could make a career out of this. When I did go off to grad school, I have a PhD in psychology and kinesiology. I remember talking to my PhD advisor, Tom Carr, about what I was going to look at. I had convinced him to set up a golf putting green in his lab, which everyone thought was crazy. And he sent me again to the library to read about Spence. And I remember sitting on the floor of the library, reading some of her articles and just thinking, wow, how amazing. And her work really on this idea that there are individual variations in anxiety and that it really does relate to cognitive performance was the impetus for a lot of the work that I did looking at how people perform under stress and athletic skills and also more recently how that plays out in specific academic anxieties like math anxiety, a fear or apprehension of math that seems to be related to math performance and we know it's not just related because people are poor at math. There's something about the anxiety itself that affects performance. So I thought I'd tell you today about some of the work that we've been doing in math anxiety, really tackling this idea, following up from Spence's ideas that variations in how much people worry in a given situation, how anxious they are, can affect cognitive performance. Spence looked at this in backwards digit tests. She looked at this in backwards writing. And we've been specifically asking, are kids and adults who are afraid of math does that affect cognitive performance specifically about math? And if so, when we're thinking about teaching math, we need to be thinking not just about the content, but about the emotional components as well. So we started looking at this in actually very young kids, because it turned out most people had said that math anxiety or this fear or apprehension about math wasn't something that developed until middle school or high school when the math 
got difficult and kids started th seeing that there were positives or negatives associated with their performance. And we thought, we're not really sure this is the case. It could be that kids much younger have anxiety about math. And if so, does this relate to their math performance? So we went to look at this, but there was actually no scale to look at this. Just like Janet developed the manifest anxiety scale, we ended up developing a scale for kids to assess their anxiety about doing math. So here's what the scale looked like. It's really was spearheaded by one of my former PhD students, Gerardo Ramirez, who's now an assistant professor at UCLA. And we asked kids questions about how anxious they felt when they had to take a big math test or when they saw numbers in their book. And kids, we asked them to respond by telling us which sort of face they felt, from very happy to very nervous. And we went through several iterations of this. On one of the previous iterations, we didn't have the really happy face. And some of the teachers said, why isn't there an extreme happy for the nervousness? So we changed it. And so the question really was, are kids anxious about math? We had a comparable scale for reading. Are they more anxious about math relative to reading? And if so, does this actually relate to their math and reading performance. So first of all, we showed that yes, kids were more anxious about math than reading. And then we asked whether it related specifically to their math performance. And we did this by having them um, do a number of problems such as something like this. How many, these were first grade children. How many squares are there they'd have to answer? If you'd seen seven pennies and you spent three, how many pennies would you have left? And what we showed is that the higher children's math anxiety, the lower their math performance. And that math anxiety was a better predictor of math and performance than reading performance, that there was something specific about this. Now, of course, the question still remains, are kids anxious about math and that causes them to perform poorly? Or is it that kids are bad at math or not performing at the level they are and they become anxious about it. And so to get at that, one thing we did was actually look at individual differences in kids' children's cognitive capacity, their working memory capacity, with the idea being that if children are really anxious about math and what anxiety does, like Janet suggested, was rob people of the cognitive resources that they need to think about math, then it might be those kids who actually have higher working memory that rely more on this cognitive capacity to perform well that are most affected. And we thought this would actually provide evidence that it's really something about the anxiety and its relationship to performance. And that's indeed what we found. We found the more anxiety, math anxiety kids had, the worse their performance, but this was markedly truer. It was more extreme for those kids higher in working memory. And when we went in to look at why that was the case, we found that high working memory children, first grade children, who were really math anxious, tended to do simpler strategies than they were capable of. capable of. When they got into an anxious situation, they would guess at the answer rather than computing it out. And we think this is because that anxiety is essentially robbing them of the working memory they need to think and move through a task. So looking very young and showing that kids as young as first grade have this math anxiety, that it relates to performance, that it might be most extreme, this effect, in kids who tend to have the most capacity to succeed, we think is important because it suggests very early on that children need to think about the anxiety and the emotional component of what they're doing, and we need to be teaching about that as much as we're teaching about the content. And in our society, often it's very um, common and socially acceptable to say, oh, I'm not a math person as an adult, and it's potentially possible that this is rubbing off on the kids and giving them anxiety about this subject. So we've actually started to ask questions about where this anxiety in the children comes from. If children are coming into early elementary school and they have anxiety about doing math more so than reading, it's related to their performance, where is this anxiety coming from in the first place? And where we've looked is at both the parents and the teachers. It turns out that if you look across all majors in college and give students an anxiety, a math anxiety scale, so asking them how nervous they get when they have to fill out um, a receipt uh, do tip on a dinner bill or if they have to take a math test. The major, does anyone want to guess what the major with the highest level of math anxiety is? I always hear psychology when I'm talking to psychologists, English. It turns out the, mayor with, the major with the highest level of math anxiety is people who are majoring in elementary education. And there's also something else that's really homogeneous about this group. Does anyone know what it is? <laughs> 
first and second grade teachers in the US are about 97% female. And so we wondered whether or not teachers of kids early in elementary school might be math anxious and contributing to both the anxiety of, their ch of the children in their class and also to poor math performance, and whether if it's all females, this might be markedly more in the girls than the boys. So we actually have done two studies. We did a first study where we had about 15 teachers and 140 kids and looked at teachers' math anxiety, and then we looked at their children's math achievement at the beginning and the end of the school year, and we showed that the higher teachers' math anxiety, the less likely kids were to be achieving at a high level at the end of the school year. We've since replicated this with over 60 teachers and 700 kids, and I want to show you some data that we've just found, and again, we show the same thing. What I'm showing you here is how much the kids grow across the school year in their math achievement, and so one would be about growing a grade level. And what we show is that for teachers who have less math anxiety, so they feel less nervous about math, for both the girl and their boy first grade students, their kids are growing more in math achievement across the school year than teachers who have more math anxiety, which is the red bar. We show that it's actually apparent in both boys and girls, but it's markedly stronger in boys. Meaning that teachers who have higher math anxiety, their children, even when they're matched at the beginning of the school year, even when we match teachers for their knowledge about teaching math, the anxiety itself is having an impact on how much kids learn across the school year in math. Not reading, if we look at this in reading, you don't see the same thing. So what we're showing now is that young children tend to have math anxiety, and one place where it's coming is through the teachers. Teachers who come into the classroom with a lot of anxiety themselves, by the end of the school year, their children are gaining less in math achievement than teachers who comparatively have less anxiety. Now, of course, kids don't just learn in the classroom. They also get a lot of knowledge at home. So we also asked whether or not parents could affect kids' math anxiety. And what we showed was something actually pretty similar to the teachers, but it was dependent on how much parents interacted with their kids around math. So some parents spend more time doing homework with their kids than others, and we showed that if a parent was not very nervous about math, if they had low math anxiety, their kids learned more across the school year when they helped them with their math homework. But Unfortunately, what we showed is that for parents who tended to be anxious about math, when they actually helped their kids with their homework, it backfired and their kids actually learned less across the school year. So this is a paper that was driven by one of my former postdocs, Aaron Maloney, and this was published last year in Psych Science. And again, what we have on the y-axis is grade change across the school year. And what you can see is that for low math anxious parents, their kids are growing about a grade across the school year. And the more homework help they have, they tend to do a little bit better, their kids. Not markedly, but a little bit. But where you really see a dramatic effect is when you look at the parents who tend to be higher in math anxiety. If parents are high in math anxiety and they help their kids with homework a lot, their kids are growing markedly less across the school year. So this means that when parents who are nervous about math are actually interacting with their kids, it's almost as if it's backfiring in some way. And that's not great because we want parents to be helpful in terms of their kids' learning and performance. And so for the last five or so minutes, I thought I would tell you about some work that we've been doing recently where we're trying to support parents who are nervous about math to help their kids in productive ways so that kids actually achieve more across the school year rather than less. And we've been doing this by using an interactive app, actually, that kids do with their parents at home. And so we built on this idea that parents, when they interact with their kids in positive ways, can show benefits in terms of what kids, children learn in terms of language, about number, about space, about math. And we know that when they interact in negative ways, it can have a deleterious effect. And so we thought, what if we could get a way for parents to interact with their kids about math in a fun, positive, structured way, so it wasn't maybe with the stress of the homework that is out there, to help parents learn how to think with their kids about math, maybe when they work on a math problem together, but maybe just to talk about math in everyday life. If I give you two cookies and I give you one more, how many do you have? Or if your brother has twice as many grapes as you do, what's the difference? These are sort of everyday things that parents could do with their kids that we know could have a positive effect and perhaps be most beneficial for parents who tend to be no most nervous about math. 
So we built on this idea that oftentimes parents do bedtime stories with their kids, so why not bedtime math? So two years ago, we partnered with um, a nonprofit that had developed a bedtime math app for children, and we did an experiment where we called it bedtime learning instead of bedtime math, and we randomly assigned about 500 families half to a bedtime reading group where the stories parents read with their kids had no math content, and half to a bedtime math group, where the stories parents read with their kids at night had a little bit of math content in them. And you can see here, here's one of the, the types of app problems that kids would get. So this is a story about whipped cream. Whipped cream was invented 500 years ago, and this is designed, really, this is for first graders, so parents are supposed to be reading this with their kids. Then you can press on one of these types of problems, and you get a question. If you can whip two cups of heavy cream into six cups of whipped cream. How many cups of air did you whip into it? You can press, you can get the answer. And because this was delivered via an app, we were able to monitor how often parents use this app with their kids. So we went into classrooms of the schools that families were in at the beginning and the end of the year. We measured math achievement, and we also measured the math anxiety of children. And we were able to figure out how much kids use this app with their parents. And so what I want to show you now is that how much kids learned in math across the school year as a function of whether or not they use the app with their parents. And what you're going to see is that for the parents who were low in math anxiety, there wasn't such a boost from using this app. But the parents who were high in math anxiety, their kids really benefited from getting to use the app. So what I'm showing you now is growth across the school year. And what you can see is that when parents didn't use the app, the parents that are higher in math, the kids of the parents that are higher in math anxiety grew a lot less than the kids of the parents that are lower in anxiety. So this is really mimicking this homework finding I showed you about before. But you see something different when you start looking at parents who actually use the app with their kids. When parents use the app maybe just once a week, now, all of a sudden, the higher math anxious kids are learning as much over the course of the school year as the low math anxious kids. And we get at least some of that boost still continuing into using it a lot. Now, of course, it could be that the parents who are using this app a lot are just better parents. They're different in some way. But we don't see this for parents who use the reading app a lot. So it can't just be parents who decided to engage with their kids show this benefit. So you only see this if you use the math app. And actually, we've now been looking at these kids across a second year, and we show that these benefits still remain for high math anxious parents, independent of if you look at app use. So you see this random assignment effect. Using this math app, if you're high in math anxiety, helps your kids grow in math achievement. And this is our data that's hot off the press. And what you can see here is we're, I'm just showing you what's going on across two years. So they started in the fall of first grade. If you look at the x-axis here, you can see the math condition is growing above the reading condition. These are parents who are really high in math anxiety. And what you see is this summer stagnation, sometimes called summer slide. We don't really see it here, but we see a summer stop in growth. And then you see second grade boosting up again. The neat thing here is that kids only use the app with their parents about once a week in first grade, and we still see the effect remaining in second grade. It says, and these are for high math anxious parents. You, again, don't see the ty same type of effect with low math anxious parents. Their kids are doing great. So what we're showing here is that an early dose of learning how to do math in a structured way with your parents can have a big effect, and that anxiety relates to performance, not just within your own, an own individual, but actually parents and teachers can really have an effect on what kids learn and how much they grow and how anxious they are. So bringing it back to Janet Spence's work, she really was one of, I think, the first influences in my career as a psychologist, understanding that individual variation in anxiety can really have an impact on your ability to think and reason through a task. And I've taken that and, and focused on this notion of variation in math anxiety and how that relates to performance, showing that there's something about the anxiety itself that impacts performance. And that it's not just the anxiety in an individual, but actually when children are tasked with learning a subject like math, the anxiety of their parents, their teachers, and the ability to have opportunities to work with their parents in fun, structured, non-pressured ways can actually change the trajectory of kids' math achievement across the first couple years of elementary school.
So I think I'll end there, and I'm happy to take questions if we have time for that, or that can be at the end. Thank you. We now turn to gender, uh, the complex topic to which Spence turned her attention in the early 1970s, when she and her UT Austin colleagues asked the question, who likes competent women? Um, Professor Alice Eg uh, Egley, who holds the James Padilla Chair of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern, will speak to the topic of gender in a few minutes. Um, first, we're going to watch a little longer clip. It's about four minutes of, of Janet talking about how she got involved in this topic um, and uh, all the complexities that intrigued her. But while I was waiting for inspiration to strike, I happened to read, for editorial reasons, the book I was editing, a study by my colleagues, uh, Elliot Aronson and Bob Helmreich, uh, about competency in men. A very interesting study. I won't go into the main purpose of it, but just to say that I was reading that study, and it occurred to me that their stimulus persons were all male, their judges were all male, and at that time that was very common. There was a large-scale preference for using men. No explanation, didn't need to. justification, of course that's, that's what the way the world do. is. That's yeah. the way it was. But feminism was in, the woman's movement was in the air, so it suddenly occurred to me to ask the obvious question, but who likes competent women? So I went to Bob and said, let's do a little study. Wouldn't that be fun? So I thought, you know, I'll just fill in the time doing that. Well, that little study grew and grew and grew and got more and more complex. And then I thought, well, maybe people's role attitudes might have something to do with their reactions. So I developed a sex role attitudes measure uh, called the Attitudes Towards Women Scale, which subsequently has taken off a life of its own. Well, I went through all of this, and by the time I finished, I was so intrigued and so enchanted with the whole thing, saying, this is my new research career. So I stumbled into it. And uh, very lucky and very glad. Well, I think the field is very glad that you did too. Not only is the attitudes towards women's scale had a long life, so has the personal attributes questionnaire, which you and yeah, Bob yeah. developed at the time. Um, I'm curious about what your colleagues thought. I mean, you were working with Bob Helmreich, who was one of your colleagues, but gender research was still quite new at that time. Did your colleagues support you in this, or were they sort of indifferent to it? Did they? sort of poo-poo it in any way? Well, of course, I was well enough established that nobody was going to uh, attack me in any way, but it was still very dangerous research for younger people to do. Uh, there were some uh, voices in the field who were very explicit about this was ridiculous, it was trivial, nobody should pay attention to it, it was a false way to go. Um, so it was not welcomed in many quarters. But it was my view that one of my tasks was to have people take this seriously. So then in all of the studies that I did, I leaned over backwards that these would, studies would be absolutely impeccable methodologically. They'd be beautifully analyzed and analyzed half to death. That everything I wrote uh, was in the most neutral vo voice possible. I did not get into political issues or take stances. And I tried to have them published in the best journals. Mm -hmm. And my view is that if I did, could do all of that, people would be likely to read it, people would be likely to respect it, and people would say, all right, this is a legitimate area of research. 
I will now introduce Professor Egley, who's the James Padilla Chair of Arts and Sciences at Northwestern. Um, she will speak to Spence's substantial contribution to the study of gender. Professor Egley, I mean, doesn't need an introduction, I know, but she's getting one. <laughs> Professor Egley has published widely in the psychology of gender and of attitudes, especially attitude change and attitude structure. She's the author of a number of highly regarded books. These include Sex Differences in Social Behavior, A Social Role Interpretation, The Psychology of Attitudes with co-author Shelley Chaikin, and Through the Labyrinth, The Truth About How Women Become Leaders with co-author Linda Carley. Eagley also is the author of numerous, numerous journal articles and chapters. She has received many prestigious awards including the Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award of the American Psychological Association. As a leading figure in the social psychology of gender, Eagley will describe key aspects of Spencer's work and how they have become integrated into contemporary theories of gender. Her presentation is entitled, Janet Spence, Innovator in the Study of Gender. Thank you very much, Lucia. That was a very nice statement from Janet Spence, so I will continue with more details. Well, Spence was a giant, I think, of, of gender research and brought us a long way, and I will try to explain that. Um, she was an early entrant into what I call the second wave research. You know, there were some first wave feminism researchers who studied cognitive differences. Um, but she came in there early um, after the Braverman studies on gender stereotypes. So she was an early entrant. Um, and I think she had a lot of ambition. She. Um, wanted to really understand the psychology of women and men and how it produces the phenomena of gender. It was not a narrow mission. I remember um, speaking to her when she was pretty early in this endeavor, and she said, I just want to start this all over again and kind of do the whole thing. She was ambitious, and that's wonderful, because she did a lot. Um, but as many of you know, she did start out with a personality approach, basically. I guess that follows because she studied anxiety in terms of individual differences. Um, and so she looked at traits that are endorsed by individuals and incorporated into the self as, as a part of being male or female and that would guide behavior. So initially, she followed, in a sense, the older tradition, which had been to study something called masculinity and femininity. Um, so there was the Terman and Miles approach, which was kind of a hodgepodge of items and had been criticized. And so she had the insight of building measures that were based on endorsement of stereotypical traits. So it followed from the early work on gender stereotyping, where two dimensions were isolated in stereotypes that were warmth, expressiveness, communion, and then more task-oriented, agentic. Um, so she constructed the personal attributes questionnaire in which people gave self-ratings on the two dimensions, which were relatively independent, and that was one of the new features, because the old masculinity of femininity had been bipolar, a single dimension. Um, so there was a co-discoverer at that time of, of that, in, you know, that insight came also from Sandra Bem, who developed the Bem sex roles inventory, which also had the two dimensions. So people were sort of seeing, oh, well, they're kind of similar. Um, and initially, Bem used her scales to predict masculine and feminine behaviors and that the communal scale would predict feminine behaviors and the masculine, the more agentic behaviors. And she did a few early experiments that demonstrated that. But then she took it in another direction <laughs> uh, to look at androgyny, the balance between the two scales, which she uh, maintained had special properties. And then she later broadened out to talk about gender schematicity, which uh, was seeing the world in gender 
terms as defined by the position on those scales and ended up with her very broad and encompassing book, The, the Lenses of Gender. That was not Janet's path <laughs> at all. Um, she took a very different path, and it was you know, never that openly critical of, of Sandra Bem's path, but I think people don't fully realize how different Janet's path was. Um, she came to realize that what she was calling initially masculinity and femininity were really much narrower than that. As a good personality theorist, she realized that the manifest content of a personality scale predicts behaviors in that domain, right? It's not mysterious. And so that the masculinity measure, which was full of agentic items, um, that, would produce, that would predict that kind of behavior. And the femininity scale would predict communal, warm, expressive behaviors, end of story, right? Not this broadening out to gender schematicity and very broad predictions. Um, and she told us at that point, I think confusing many people, that the PAQ was wrongly regarded as general, a general measure of masculinity and femininity. Because masculine and femininity would suggest it would predict anything masculine and anything feminine, right? All kinds of behaviors. And Janet came to articulate that that was actually not correct, that was not a good prediction, and furthermore, not her prediction. But she led people there to the wrong predictions by calling it masculinity and femininity. And she was retreating then from that path. So um, she rejected then the PAQ as actually properly assessing what we call gender identity, which is it's known now these are measures of gender identity right still. Well, um, maybe that's not the right way to think about them. Um, and I think at this point, what I'm going to tell you now is, is not r widely recognized. It was published in her later papers. Um, and somehow didn't get picked up, even by gender scholars very much. Um, so she argued that gender identity is something else, that it's much more basic, um, and it is one's existential sense of self as a man or a woman, or perhaps something in between. Um, but that this is your acceptance of self at the psychological level, and it is not assessed by the masculinity and femininity scales. So she viewed it as more basic, and that it is in fact unidimensional and bipolar. Um, and so you can think of a scale, you know, I think of myself as a woman and value that, or as a man, you know, so there are two ends to a single scale. So she came at us then with this unipolar version of gender. And so I think, I don't think I really got it at that point. I thought maybe then what, what do we do with the PAQ, which everybody is calling gender identity? Well, um, what did she say then? She said it very simply in her writing that gender identity is your essential self the sense of yourself as male or female, but she didn't have any theoretical context for it. And I think that's why it got lost, because it was merely in some articles, as in the, the Nebraska Symposium, which perhaps was not so widely read at that point. And she said it like in a paragraph or whatever, and it got lost. Um, and I think what might have helped gender scholars incorporate that very important insight that she had was social identity theory, which was really just developing at that point in time. And I think she was not, you know, why would she be particularly tuned into what these scholars in the UK were doing with social identity theory? She wasn't. And so that in social identity theory, the, the idea that important social identities are founded in groups, they come from groups, is very uh, well articulated and explained and developed theoretically. 
And within that context, one's identity as male or female is one important form of identity of many. And so that's what she didn't link to or really develop. And so it became just something that was in her articles that we didn't fully appreciate. Uh, in terms of um, the social identity approach, there are a number of measures that have been developed since in that tradition. So, um, these are scales like the Luther and Crocker's importance of identity subscale, and you might have items such as being a woman is an important reflection of who I am. That's, that's Janet's sense of gender as the essential self in the self. Um, but she didn't really provide us those measures either. She just said this was important. So where did that leave her or leave us with this uh, gender identity problem? Um, because she developed the scales that are so widely used, the PAQ, and she was saying they're no longer identity scales, you shouldn't think about them that way. And so what she argued that um, various aspects of our essential sense of ourselves as male or female just become attached to different kinds of traits. That it's common that the sense of self is attached to agentic and communal traits, but it can be attached to a lot of other things too. It could be attached to like um, the way I dress or the way I speak or cognitive characteristics that could be masculine and feminine. So she saw at that point gender as what she called multidimensional not multidimensional in the essential sense of self, that's unidimensional, she said, but it gets linked to a lot of other qualities. It may be that the most important is agentic and communal, but she argued that there were other kinds of linkages that people develop. And so the gender is essentially multidimensional and should not be overly simplified, and certainly not in terms of the, the two dimensions of the scale that she created. Um, well, that kind of thinking is developed in social identity theory, as many of you know if you're social psychologists, that um, they argue that uh, self-categorization um, fosters self-stereotyping. So there's an important link in social identity theory. If you identify with a particular group as important to yourself, you take on the traits of the group that are ascribed to the group and ascribe those to yourself too. So there is a, a strong theoretical link that would be consistent, very consistent with Janet's reasoning. So what I have argued in a recent paper with uh, Wendy Wood, which was in Sex Roles, um, is that it's sensible to regard self-categorization of oneself as male or female and the ascription of, of stereotypic traits to oneself is really very linked, as Janet said and social identity theorists say. They're really two sides of the same coin. If you, if you grasp onto a group identity, you take stuff with it, right? You take the attributes of the group. You may weight them differently, individual differences or whatever, but you take the attributes of the group into yourself too. So we argue that it's okay to consider both of these um, kinds of measures and concepts to be identity, but to keep it separate in your mind as a researcher, know what you are doing when you choose one or the other. And what we argue is that um, the gender self-categorization most directly predicts group-level reactions. So that would be valuing the in-group and you know, being suspicious of the out-group. So sort of group-level reactions would be directly predicted from these identity measures as they are in social identity theory. And that the PAQ and its cousin, the BSRI, predict agentic and communal behavior. End of story, as Janet argued. Don't expect them to predict other masculine and feminine phenomena. Um, just, and I think they're often misused and so that people in the sense misused, people get poor prediction because they're not predicting forms of agency and communion, they're predicting other kinds of masculinity and femininity, which Janet would say would not be predicted, and I would say would not be predicted. You would need different kinds of uh, aspects of masculinity and, and femininity to develop separate scales to assess those. <clears throat> 
Um, stereotypes. Uh, Janet remained puzzling about, puzzled about gender stereotypes. So in one of her late, you know, one of her last articles, she railed against gender stereotypes and said that they're false beliefs. And so why would a psychologist think we're all running around with false beliefs? That doesn't make much sense. And I think that what she didn't appreciate um, was how these gender stereotypes and then the, 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 the measures that she predicted from her PAQ measures are not based on some false ground, but they're based on the social position of men and women in society. So she didn't take the step to social structure. How are men and women um, located in society, and that that's why agency and communion are her two, her two scales, pick up so much reality because it, it does represent the different ways that men and women are positioned in society. And so the information that men are agentic and women as communal is something we see every day. And it's not just in the, division, the old division of labor between being uh, a worker or a homemaker, which indeed has broken down, but what we still have alive and well is that women are, are disproportionately in communally demanding roles. We just learned about elementary school teachers being in the first two grades being 97 or 98 percent women, right? Um, and men are more often observed in um, agentically demanding roles, particularly leadership roles at the high level with a lot of authority, right? And other kinds of roles that are regarded as agentic. So we see agency and communion acted out differentially by men and women on an everyday basis. So it's not mysterious that we have gender stereotypes and they're in fact not false beliefs because they do represent inferences from the kinds of behaviors that we observe on a daily basis with women much more likely observed it, it, engaging in communally behavior, communally relevant behavior, and men agentically relevant behavior. Um, so she didn't take it to that, those extra steps that I think are important. And then there is something of an irony in in developing those scales and sort of not believing in sex differences as she seemed not to and thought that they're stereo stereotypic and they're not there, in that her measures and BEM's measures do produce rather large sex differences. So for example, in um, Jean Twenge's meta-analysis on the masculinity and femininity scales, if you average over masculinity and femininity, the effect size is 0.73, which we regard as large in psychology. These do differentiate between men and women. It's true that in Twenge's meta-analysis, the masculinity effect has decreased in size, so the, the femininity one not, um, but it remains fairly robust even in contemporary studies. Um, and even more striking is the sex difference in occupational interests that we see um, that uh, Richard Lippa and a number of other researchers have pursued. So if we look at people-oriented versus thing-oriented occupational differences, the effect size in D terms is larger than one, such as we hardly ever see in psychology. <laughs> So the, the occupational segregation we get definitely follows the interests of men and women, which are quite different on that kind of scale. Um, and the reason we get such large differences is, you know, some psychologists have argued that all sex differences are small. These are not small. And the reason that they're not small is that they're aggregated, right? If you follow the principle of aggregation, the um, masculinity and femininity scales aggregate across a lot of traits, right, that are a little bit gendered. And then um, the occupational interest scales also aggregate across a lot of different interest items. And as you aggregate um, sex differences that are all small and you aggregate similar ones, you'll get a large effect size. <laughs> 
which represents the sort of overall level of what we observe and what exists in society. So I think that Spence took us a very long way in terms of understanding gender and that some of her important insights about this essential sense of gender being different from these M and F scales we kind of neglected and should bring forward. Um, but she didn't uh, get us to the understanding of, of how gender works within the social structure. But she did a lot and I'm certainly grateful for her work and have found it very valuable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Egley. I think it's really important for people to understand uh, Janet's work and the de detail that you presented it, so thank you. No clip this time, we're waiting till the end um, and we're taking a little different uh, turn as uh, was mentioned earlier. So Donald Foss is our third and final speaker and Don was a colleague of Spence at the University of Texas at Austin for many years. He joined the psychology department at UT as an assistant professor in 1967, um, the same year that Janet joined the department, but she joined it as a professor, um, having come from a different department on campus. Um, so they knew each other for a long time at UT. Um, Don then relocated to Florida State University in 1995, two years before Janet retired in 1997. After leaving UT, Foss served as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Florida State and later accepted the position of Senior Vice President and Provost at the University of Houston, where he's currently Professor of Psychology. His research interests have been in cognitive psychology, specializing in language comprehension. More recently, he has turned his attention to the factors that de determine success in college. He has recently published his evidence-based book on the topic, Your Complete Guide to College Success. Um, Foss and Spence work together quite closely at UT. For example, he succeeded her as editor of Contemporary Psychology, and he was the associate editor of the Annual Review of Psychology during her editorship. Foss will review some of Spence's many professional contributions in his presentation, Janet Taylor Spence, Exemplary Initiative. Don. Thanks very much. It's a, a pleasure and somewhat scary for me to be here because uh, I'm supposed to uh, talk about this person who was uh, basically a lifelong friend, friend of mine. So thanks to, uh, uh, so let me point out, this is a, a page from uh, Contemporary Psychology, the, the um, book review journal that was, that was mentioned. And it's, it's a review of a book and the title of the review, not picked by Janet, but it was a significant achievement which also stands for her life uh, in my opinion. Um, so thanks to uh, the others on this panel, we know something about the outlines of her history and of her contributions to the science, uh, but she did um, a whole lot more. And uh, these are some of the topics uh, that I want to briefly touch on this afternoon. Uh, she was a, a person that did a lot of editing and was a synthesizer. Uh, she made major contributions to her institutions of all sorts, including uh, the University of Texas, where, as uh, was mentioned, I was her colleague for many years. Many professional contributions, and she was a leader in some national agenda-setting activities that, that I will touch, touch on. Um, she was a really interesting person. Maybe you saw some of that in the, in the um, little film clips. She had a very expressive face. Uh, she could be very kind to people. She could also kick your butt. Uh, and I will say a word or two about all of that as I go along. Um, Janet uh, was, as was mentioned, she became uh, the associate editor of the journal called Contemporary Psychology uh, in uh, 1968. Uh, at, th at that time, uh, this, this journal was, uh, had been edited by a colleague uh, I did not know uh, at, the, at the University of Texas named Fillmore Sanford. Fillmore died on the job, and uh, in this little editorial, the editorials in contemporary psychology were called CP Speaks uh, with that very modern uh, logo. 
Boring, uh, the, the man that had written a kind of famous and now maybe infamous history of, of psychology and was the founding editor of CP. Uh, and uh, Janet gets fourth billing in this uh, a little editorial, uh, perhaps appropriately, but I think you can get a little sense of the good old boy network uh, is not terribly uh, disguised in that. So Janet was the associate editor to Gardner Lindsay and when his term finished, she was selected to be the editor of uh, contemporary psychology. And, and when she became the editor, it became much more contemporary. I mean, notice the fat uh, print here and the fact you can more or less read. Uh, but when she became the editor, we got this nice contemporary type font and everything became smaller so you couldn't read it. Uh, uh, so for those of you who fuss over deadlines, and that's probably everyone here, I mean, consider this. Contemporary psychology published 1,000 pages a year. It came out monthly. Uh, and I, as was indicated, I know a lot about this review process, and I want to talk about it just for a minute, uh, because Janet asked me to be her associate editor over, this, over the six years that she was editor. And here we are. I know. First of all, I like this picture of her a lot better than the pictures uh, that you see otherwise. Uh, and then there's this doofus guy in the short sleeve dress shirt and the bad teeth. The only way I'm better now is I spray this gray in my hair. Um, so here is a little uh, page, and I, I, can you all see that? I think so. Uh, showing a little bit about how CP worked. Um, the way we had a set of what were called advisory editors, uh, and it's, I suspect it still works that way. Um, and this was a pretty distinguished group. I mean, if you can see the second person on there was a future National Medal of Science winner, and you will know many uh, of, the, of the people uh, on, on that list, uh, some of whom are at this convention uh, that, that I've run across. So the way it worked was the books would come, and at that time, everything was done in Austin, Texas. There was no part of CP that was produced in Washington, D.C. at the APA. Uh, it was all done in Austin, including the printing. So the books would come, two copies, to these two little offices we had uh, in the psych department in Austin, and then one of them would be sent off to the advisory editor by postage. The advisory editor would make recommendations about whether the book should be reviewed or not. Incidentally, we had a little triage before that where a lot of them were just declared non-reviewable. Uh, uh, the book would come back, uh, invitations would be sent out, uh, somebody would finally accept, uh, and this process was all done by U.S. mail. Uh, we had these things, uh, we had letters, and, and we had these things, you may have seen one, it's called a postcard. Uh, they were very popular in their day. Uh, and as I mentioned, so how many books? A lot of books, one per hour every working day of the year. 2,000 books a year. That's about three weeks worth of books uh, of single copies. Uh, and we, got, we had two copies. Uh, and also, every month Janet put the issue together. Every month she did the blue line editing. And every month she did the page prints, page proofs. And she did 60% of, of the editing, always almost, with good cheer uh, and complete dedication because this was the realm of ideas in psychology writ large. Like, in its own way, the psych review and the psych bulletin, something that covered the discipline. Um, and uh, she never missed, as far as I know, one of those 36 deadlines a year. Uh, and oh, occasionally, over a drink, uh, she would grouse about uh, some late review or some incomprehensible review that she would rewrite or occasionally have me rewrite. Um, uh, she she uh, also, as was mentioned, became a little bit later on uh, the editor of, again, one of the most important outlets in our discipline, the Annual Review of Psychology. And this time uh, she wrote me in along with John Darley to be one of her associate editors. And in that role, I got to watch her chair the uh, Board of Editors meetings for the annual review, which was a very interesting experience because 
She was sometimes tense, and you, again, if you look at those film clips, you can sometimes see little rays of steel coming out of, <laughs> coming out of her eyes because she was a, she was a strong woman. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, one of the most uh, cited outlets for us. And in the editorial uh, where the topics and the uh, potential authors were chosen, uh, she did not uh, suffer wa time-wasting comments. But then, uh, over the dinner, she would have this wry and sometimes biting sense of humor and, and, uh, and be a wonder wonderful colleague. So here uh, you can see uh, a list of her editorial duties. Uh, and if you look at the bottom there, you see that it is a what's what of psychology journals then and now. Uh, a, an extremely impressive set of, of, um, uh, of journals that she worked for. And as uh, I, uh, was also mentioned, she won something called the National Academy of Sciences Award for Scientific Reviewing. Well, that's been going on for 37 years, and there have been exactly five psychologists uh, who've, who've won that award. The first three of them, incidentally, were all former APA presidents, and more recently, uh, Dan Schachter and, and Larry Squire. They won't be APA presidents, um, I predict. Um, and her award not only mentioned her uh, scientific reviewing, but also other things, uh, including uh, being interested in, in policy. Um, so Janet was the chair of the psych department at, at uh, UT Austin. Uh, and uh, in 1969, following Gardner Lindsay, who had been her predecessor, and who had, as was mentioned, adroitly arranged for her to be uh, transferred from the Ed Psych Department, uh, where she had been because her husband was uh, Kenneth Spence, she was not allowed to be in the psychology department uh, for nepotism rules, and before that wasn't even allowed to be in the university for a while. Um, but she was a bit unlucky in her timing uh, there. She wrote about her experience uh, as follows. I hardly had time to unpack when I received a call from the soon to be notorious liberal arts dean John Silber telling me I had approximately two hours in which to make large cuts in the recommendations for faculty salary raises for the coming year. And later that day, he demanded still further cuts. And this guy Silber, some of you may have heard of him, but he later became the president of Boston University and even ran for governor of uh, the state of Massachusetts. And he was in a titanic, meaningless clash uh, with the chairman of the UT Board of Regents over who was going to run the university, basically. Silber lost. Um, and Gardner Lindsay, in print, called Silber ruthless. Uh, and Janet had to deal with this guy and with this whole event. And she's not a person to back away from conflict. Uh, as will become clear even in a few minutes, uh, but I just know that she did not like sailing in, the, in those roiling waters because from her point of view, this was just an ego clash and had nothing in principle uh, uh, behind it. And, uh, but she was nevertheless a, a very fine and fair department chair, and, in, and some of the things she had to deal with, Mezzi's Hall, where we were burned <laughs> during her time, it was a pretty serious fire, she and her then assistant chair, Bob Helmreich, who later became uh, her collaborator a lot in, in uh, gender work, uh, they did a great job. And not only that, they got the building next door for us. And those of you who are in academia know what that takes. Uh, and that was very important for the growth of the psych department because UT Austin was emerging from being a very fine regional university to the national powerhouse it is today. And the psych department needed that space to keep up with that. Um, but she didn't want to continue that, and so she declined to serve a second term as department chair um, and, and moved to being a champion of science and to, she had decades of important research work to do and also lots of other professional contributions uh, to make. So here's a little list of some of the professional uh, things that she was involved in. Uh, National Research Councils, uh, AAAS Active, uh, the James McKean Cattell uh, Foundation Trustee, et cetera, et cetera. It, it goes on. And she received many awards and belonged to a number of honorary societies, including Phi Beta Kappa when she was an undergraduate, to a, uh, a three honorary doctorate degrees, a National Academy of Science Award, as I've already mentioned, 
and, and others. Uh, all of these uh, um, well, well deserved. And she was highly active in lots of professional societies. So she was on the Psychonomic Governing Board, on, she was the president of the Southwestern Psychological Association, and she was the only person ever to be both the president of the American Psycholo Psychological Association and now what we call the Association for Psychological Science. Uh, on, her, on her vita, she still had it as the American Psychological Society. Uh, um, and I, I, no one will ever be president of both again, I don't think. The, the cultures are such that that's not going to happen, and that's why I made these comments about our two uh, colleagues who may be at this meeting, uh, that I don't think they will be. In the APA, she was not only the president, but she was a lot of other things. She was on the Board of Scientific scientific affairs, she was on the publications and communications board, very important uh, parts of APA. And uh, an important one that I, that I really want to mention right now is the Commission on Organization of APA. So I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, talk, talking about that. Thirty years ago this October, a group of psychologists stating that they represented the state affairs and practitioner cons constituents of APA wrote to the APA Board of Directors. Um, now, I debated about whether putting this up because you're not an attorney, right? No, uh, th there's no attorneys in this room to sue me. Uh, they wrote that funds spent on reorganization are being used to advance yet one more version of the South African experience with those traditionally in power proposing to create separate enclaves for the true majority enclaves which will, of course, be very separate and will not contaminate the purity of those hoping against mad hope to retain power. And they went on to say, while well, Chuck Kiesler and Janet Spence, leading the rush toward apartheid, are permitted easy access to the APA deliberative bodies, we have been kept away from it. This happened. Um, now, Kiesler and Spence were not going to back away, and they responded in, an, in another a memo that said, we prefer a reorganized APA, the assemblies cooperate, they have mutual respect, um, et cetera. Uh, and the reorganization attempt failed, and APS is born. Uh, with Chuck Kiesler was its first president, Janet Spence was its first elected president, and of course, Alan Kraut was the executive director and, and, uh, and leader for, for many years. So I have two final things to say. First of all, I think of myself as a self-made man. In this sense, as long as myself is construed to be Janet Spence, Gardner Lindsay, Jim Jenkins, my PhD advisor, the University of Minnesota, where I got my degree, etc. In that sense, I am a self-made man because these people helped me and all of us by virtue of helping these kinds of institutions be uh, the, the success that they are and pushing our, our science forward. And the last thing I want to say is that uh, Janet was widely read and, uh, would, and really loved students. Uh, and at one point she gave a Psychi distinguished, elec distinguished lecture and she talked about the importance of asking tough questions and reading broadly and going to whatever source, historical sources, uh, hist uh, literature, political science, etc. And after this talk, uh, she uh, concluded with, um, with, with this uh, little statement which comes from Mark Twain, to be good is noble, she said, but to teach others to be noble, to, sorry, let me start over. <laughs> to be able to speak English is noble, <laughs> but to teach others to be good is nobler and no trouble. Thanks. We're going to let Janet say the last words for the evening. Uh I'm not going to try to predict the future, and I, whether I have any wisdom to give, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think that while this is a very exciting time, it's also a very difficult time for many people.
uh, funding sources are down, jobs are hard to get. I, I want to give the word to everyone that do the best you can, times are going to get better. And that not all research can be at the cutting edge, <coughs> even of these younger people. Ideas are wonderful at the beginning, but then there's the grinding process of following up all the implications. And then there's the new theory that comes along. So that I can only wish them well. But I think basically what I hope for all of them is that they're doing what they're doing because they love it, because it's fun that whether they're award-winning or not, it's important. And that's my feeling about what I have done. I can't think of anything more I would rather have done. It was fun, and uh, I wish everybody the same kind of joy that I had, and that's really what I would like to tell them, enjoy yourself, what you do is important, and please have fun.